You're listening to Frontlines, a podcast for the people that truly make mountain biking happen. Not the riders, racers, or product designers, but the builders, advocates, and the often forgotten board members of your local mountain bike trail association. The International Mountain Bicycling Association has been around since 1988. And no matter what has happened, that name is instantly recognized. Not just by mountain bikers, but by land managers and political leaders alike. The trust that land managers have with IMBA is valuable. There's no denying that fact. Unfortunately, the United States is divided, and this is just as true in the mountain bike community. Some disagree with policy choices IMBA has made, Many riders are losing trust in the brand, and for others, it's become synonymous with sterile or diluted trails. But for those of us who consider ourselves trail advocates, most of us can agree that there's a need for federal representation, and the success of IMBA is our best hope for this. We've looked at two other organizations in previous episodes, each larger than the last. First, the Caribou Mountain Bike Consortium in Williams Lake, British Columbia. And last episode, we explored the Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance in Washington State. It's now time to learn more about the biggest trail association of them all. I'm your host, Brian Hillier. You're listening to episode 14 of Frontlines. My guest is the new executive director of IMBA and founder of the Gunnison Trails, David Waynes. Now it's important to recognize that when Dave and I refer to IMBA, we're referring to IMBA US. Any IMBA organizations outside of the US, this includes IMBA Canada, Argentina, and Europe, have simply licensed the IMBA name from the US IMBA, which is a testament to the power that the IMBA name carries around the world. Hi Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. First off, congratulations on the new position with IMBA. Thank you. And I think many mountain bikers are familiar with your professional riding career, but you've got a a trail advocacy resume as well. You're the founder of Gunnison Trails out in Gunnison, Colorado. And uh, what types of projects and initiatives were you a part of out in Gunnison? Well, and I, I imagine it's very similar to a lot of trail organizations where we got started because we had some trails that needed some maintenance. Uh, they were falling into disrepair and there was nobody uh, really to do it. They were on BLM public lands. And uh, at that time, our BLM, uh, it's a huge uh, field office as far as the acreage they have. And recreation uh, wasn't as much a priority then. This is you know years and years ago. So we organized and, and worked uh, with uh, the BLM office and and uh, you know, slowly earned their trust to be able to go out and and do some trail maintenance. So we learned trail maintenance. You know, I took the, the crew leader training and uh, things like that. So uh, at some point along the way, the the IMBA book came out, and there was a lot of good information in there on trail maintenance. But I think a lot of those a lot of trail organizations start that way with, hey, how can we take care of what we already have, and then uh, it quickly uh, evolves into the educational component that is so important to to local land managers, depending on where you live. Uh, around here, it's, it's uh, you know, wildlife advocates, and we've got spring closures for some sensitive species and things like that. Uh, and then, you know, the good, good trail etiquette in uh, the area that we were working primarily in, it's called Hartman Rocks Recreation Area. It's a phenomenal trail system, 50 miles of single track, but it's shared use. It's open to motos, always has been, uh, always will be. So uh, there are certainly other users out there. There's the occasional equestrian users, but lots of, uh, lots of walkers, lots of runners, lots of mountain bikers. There's rock climbing out there. Uh, there's people driving, you know, razors and things like that on the roads. Uh, it more and more, uh, especially compared to when I first was out there, it gets a ton of use uh, by a lot of different user groups. So that whole, you know, learning how to, to share and play together well, I think maybe sometimes advocates come to the table and, and I was like this you kind of have the blinders on and you're, you're solely focused on what you do. And then as you get into advocacy, your vision slowly widens and you realize that there's a whole huge landscape out there and land managers, whether they're from the BLM or the Forest Service, the big federal agencies or a county park, state park, uh, municipalities, 
they're dealing with everybody. Uh, and so they look at it through a much different lens than, than we do as mountain bikers or as the moto community or the equestrian community. And so I've always felt like it's really important and, and part of what I always try to do with our advocates here in Gunnison is help help expand their vision if they if they need that so they can really see uh, you know some of the the situations and the issues through a, a completely different lens and I think it adds clarity to to then how you conduct yourself in some of those discussions with other users and land managers. Fantastic. Gunnison Trails is uh, is not an IMBA chapter, but you've certainly had a history with IMBA before uh, taking on this new role. You sat on the board, but to focus more on that local club level, as executive director of, of Gunnison Trails, what was your relationship with IMBA at that time? Well, and I've known about IMBA, you know, since the earliest time. I remember when they were formed and, and I'm probably a typical IMBA member. I think our stats, and I, don't, I only know this now because I'm, I'm obviously immersed in the organization, but our, our typical member renews every other year. And I think that was me just because uh, I became a member. I want to support and I engaged with IMBA on different, uh, different things along the way. But in uh, 2015, uh, they had some strategic planning in Park City, Utah, and they asked four people from outside of the organization to, to participate. And uh, I was asked and uh, I thought it was a great opportunity. And just the chapter question that you brought up, it was one that was on my mind, uh, was, you know, there are a lot of organizations that aren't chapters. Now, Gunnison Trails has always been an IMBA club, and uh, there's a couple different levels of, of being an IMBA club. You either have uh, more or less than 100 members. Uh, and I know some other Colorado organizations might be in that same boat. Trails 2000 in Durango is, is one of them. Uh, and we, so we supported them, but, but we weren't part of the chapter program. And that was one of the things I brought up in, in this, uh, this this strategic planning meeting was there are a lot of organizations around the country that aren't IMBA chapters, and they might be clubs or completely unaffiliated organizations, but they're uh, doing great work on the ground. And while Gunnison Trails and, and Trails 2000 and Durango as well, we don't position ourselves solely as a uh, mountain biking organization. So that's a little bit different. Uh, Salida Mountain Trails too over in Salida. It's more uh, also, uh, you know, we're what we call human powered. So we're uh, walking, trail running, and mountain biking. And each organization can, can make that distinction. But uh, that's not why uh, we didn't choose to be a chapter. But, uh, you know, I brought that up. And it's, it's, a, it's a hard one because at that time, IMBA was very focused on the chapter program and wanted to uh, really, you know, work to grow chapters. So that was just a part, you know, one part of the conversation in Park City. But so that was my first sort of immersion into IMBA and uh, got to know some of the board and uh, certainly some of the staff. And then uh, the the board chair at the time, Bob Winston, you know, late in 2015, asked me if I would want to come onto the board. And uh, I accepted that position. So a little over a year ago, I started on uh, the board. So January 2016 was when my term started. And... Uh, then uh, took over as board chair in October, maybe it was November of 2016, and uh, you know had really had only been to that was my first, second, third board meeting down in Bentonville. And you don't just you know instantly come into an organization with you know a full understanding and, and you know as a board member and, and really a lot of those board members they run they do full uh, terms which are three three year terms so so nine years on the board if you were to, to max out your term. And, you know, that's a long time to be on, but it also takes a while to get up to speed on an organization. And I'm not the kind of person that just, you know, jumps into something and, and um, you know, I, I like to listen a lot and, and understand what's going on and learn um, before I get, I get too active. And certainly that's how I, I uh, looked at my, my role on the IMBA board and my motivation to get on the IMBA board. And it was one, I've been on a lot, uh, you know, quite a few boards and this was one I really wanted to be on because mountain biking is so important to me. It's been such a huge part of my life. Um, I'm always looking to give back to, to the, the, the sport of mountain biking because it's, it's such a great sport. And those of us who are mountain bikers understand that um, like nobody else does. Last episode, I, I spoke with the folks over at Evergreen, and, and they're a great example of a, a statewide umbrella. And what can IMBA do that a state or multi-state representative group can't? Well, if the one area that IMBA can be effective is at the national level 
and that would be for some of the, the larger decisions that take place on, on the federal lands. And certainly that's a focus uh, for us to be as effective as we can be in our relationships with the BLM. You know, there's a lot of great mountain biking that takes place on BLM, and those are those are uh, you know those discussions start at the at the highest level and trickle down into the local field offices. The same thing with the U.S. Forest Service. I mean, between the Forest Service lands and, and the BLM lands out west, uh, that's where a lot of the the mountain biking takes place. So those are important national uh, national discussions. Uh, I absolutely agree with you that, that state organizations can be influential, and Evergreen is one that. I've heard of them for a long time. I was at a, a conference years ago, and uh, their uh, ED at the time, uh, I got to, to know him, and he told me a little bit about Evergreen. So I, th I think Evergreen's a great organization. They're very effective. They get things done. Um, and the uh, if more and more organizations go that way, I think IMBA can still support at the highest level. But I don't feel like IMBA needs to to own all of advocacy all across the country. Um, we want to help where we can, and right now there's 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 one good state organization in Evergreen. Now there's there's Sorba, which is uh, you know it's an it's a it's part of IMBA. Um, you know Michigan is a state with a lot of uh, a lot of collaborative, uh, and, and those were a lot of there are a lot of IMBA chapters there, and California is another state where there's a lot of uh, exchange between the chapters. And I really don't know the landscape in California as far as non-chapter organizations, but uh, it's, it's challenging to organize on any level. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what is a, what has you know, been able to happen in Washington is, is, is really special. But I think that my point would be that there's always going to be a place for IMBA to work. And one of our goals uh, moving forward is to continue to support our chapters, obviously. Uh, I'd like to figure out how we can support other um, IMBA clubs and non-affiliated affiliated organizations too, because our mission is to you know create, protect, and enhance uh, great places to ride mountain bikes, and that means uh, creating great mountain biking and trails all across this country. Mm -hmm. And there are some places that there are communities or areas where there there isn't a local mountain biking organization, and if IMBA can help with that process, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm a I'm an advocate of of what IMBA is doing, and and I think a lot of people are are advocates of of what IMBA is doing, and especially at that national level. And that's something that the grassroots clubs can't do, and and it's something that the state clubs can't do either. And and you know, but there's been a lot of change at IMBA recently. The the loss of of a major sponsor is a huge one. There's been you know layoffs, and there's been layoffs across the whole bike industry as well. But but recently, you know, very recently actually, Bruce Bruce Alt, who whose role was kind of national advocacy, was was let go, and, and so that's a huge role. And I know there's a lot of concern right now amongst clubs and chapters that you know to lose that person in that national role, is that going to take away from the presence that IMBA has in that national influence out in DC? Well, no, those are all, those are all good questions. Um, but I think the, we have to remember that. And it's the same thing, like you said, happens in, in all organizations is that IMBA had slowly, you know, starting with Subaru, IMBA had slowly become, um, a much smaller organization. There were there have been a series of layoffs, and you know the the RDs that force was reduced uh, all across the organization. And as we look to the future, we um, you know we were in a position where we needed to continue that. Uh, and the term I hear is right sizing. And sometimes you have to you have to, to contract before you can stabilize and start to expand again. And at times there are resources that, that organizations, um, you know, simply can't afford to have anymore. And I think that that's what you've seen along the way with IMBA. And, you know, it happens in all companies where we have to, to you know, get our financial house in order so we can continue to, um, to you know, move forward and make progress. And uh, that's what those, those recent rounds of, um, of cost-cutting measures were, and certainly were not as effective 
um, now as we were when we had Bruce. But you know, the the idea is that and Imba's still in a, a challenging period. You know, we're our membership is is down, our sponsorship dollars are down. Um, you know, there's been reverberations from from everything that's happened in the organization, starting with Subaru. But what's really interesting to me is that I think people thought that 2016 Imba just you know quit working. Well, Trail Solutions in in 2016 was building trail uh, throughout the whole year, all over the country. And our chapters, while there was a little bit of of you know wow, you know what's going on at Imba, we're losing some of these these field resources that we had. Those chapters kept working. I don't think the chapters threw in the towel. I think the chapters kept working. I just met with the chapter out in Portland, Oregon, and, and these guys have been working on this project, uh, you know, that's crammed between a couple freeways in a in a uh, a part of town that really needs an urban trail system, and they're just continuing to make progress with it. And at the end of 2016, there were more better places to ride mountain bikes than there had ever been before because of work that not only Imba but also um, you know chapters and clubs and organizations had been doing all over all over the country so um, but because of the I think the messaging that's gone out chapters uh, you know probably telling their members and, and, and rightfully so hey guys you know maybe don't renew with Imba until we know exactly what's going on with the chapter program our membership revenue has has um, you know it's it's less than it was at this time last year. And same thing with some of our sponsors. So we have to be mindful of that yeah. and be very careful with our with our financial resources yeah. moving forward. And it's not unlike a family yeah. that um, suddenly doesn't have the the income that they once had. They have to start making some really hard decisions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think there's no doubt that the chapters are are, are doing a great job and, and local clubs are, are doing a, a great job. There's There's... 600 over 600 trail associations in the u.s some of them are are multi-user based some of them are specific to mountain biking and and imba um you know of that uh of those clubs and organizations out there 37 percent of them are 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 actually imba chapters but imba is moving towards this 50 50 membership share um, you know, so half of the revenue that chapters collect uh, from membership is going to IMBA and, and that's up from previous years. You know, a lot of regional directors have been laid off recently and, and, and some of the IMBA services are going to kind of pay per use model. And so I think a lot of folks are, are kind of asking the question, what's the benefit right now of becoming a chapter? Um, what does IMBA provide uh, a chapter right now? Because I think that the chapters are doing a great job and they're doing a great job or a lot of clubs are doing a great job on their own. And those clubs that aren't chapters are kind of questioning what does the chapter system provide for them? Yeah, so actually the 50-50 split has moved in favor of the chapters. It was 60-40, IMBA 60, chapters 40. Now it's now it's we've moved to fifty fifty, so it's actually um, moved in favor of the chapters, and you know we spend a good bit of our of our fifty percent of that the the fifty that the chapter gets is is just you know a, a check that that is made to the chapter. Um, we spend a good bit of that that fifty you know uh, processing membership, which is which is uh, something that we need to get better at. But I think the the average for nonprofit you know member processing is. Uh, it, it's a pretty significant chunk. Just you know, when you think about everything that goes into how you process memberships, there it, it certainly isn't uh, isn't uh, insignificant portion. So uh, when you look at the you know the membership fee and uh, you know how much of it goes to the chapter, then Imba gets to keep it. And then if we're you know using that to employ RDs, certainly you're correct. The RD force isn't what it used to be, but that's that's why this whole thing ended up having a challenge with when Subaru pulled out is because there was a, a large subsidy that was going into the chapter program. And Imba was, uh, you know, providing that through relationships with Subaru and the cash that they would bring into the table, as well as those automobiles. And as soon as that came up, so the, the chapter system doesn't pay for itself on its own. Imba has to go out and fundraise to subsidize the chapter system. So we're actually contributing extra um, cash into the the relationship with the chapters to try to help them put trails on the ground. And we're happy to do that because of the work that's happening. But that means that our sponsorship and our you know, major donor program and any other revenue producing uh, programs that we have 
Um, and that's typical. That's what nonprofits do. Nonprofits, they, they fund programming. And in a lot of cases, they have to fundraise to subsidize the gaps between um, maybe if, if there is a, a, a revenue source from the program, in this case, it's, it's membership dues. Um, but what we actually you know, pay to chapters is a much larger sum than that. And, and we have to fundraise for that. And that's where the bicycle industry comes in. That's where major donors come in or any other uh, ways that we can fundraise. And, and so that, there's a huge emphasis. That's why you have the, the development uh, shop in, in most nonprofits. That, those people that work in there, their job is to, is to go out and raise the additional funds necessary to pursue your mission. And the chapter program has been a, an important part of that. We would love nothing more than to give even more money back to the chapters and uh and take even less but uh you know we have to i guess we have to get some of it and in, in the chapter conversations that i had um it really ran the gamut i mean there's two over 200 chapters and and um what's really challenging is that they're they're not all different but there's a lot of differences in there. there's a spectrum of what they're involved in and what they need and what one chapter needs badly another chapter doesn't need at all they've got that covered and we had you know plenty of chapters and big ones saying, hey, we don't mind the revenue share because we have more resources that we bring into our, our club um, from other sources. And this is just extra money for us. And we don't have to deal with membership. Uh, or we had other clubs too that or chapters that were you know very concerned about every dollar and, and what was in but doing with their money. But if you look at the chapter program and, and you're talking about putting staff all around the country and having them be able to mobilize mobilize and, and drive and visit and spend time and access different chapters, it's, it's a very expensive program. Uh, but hopefully some great things, you know, come of that and have come of that. So, you know, moving forward, there's some changes coming down with, with IMBA. And, and one of those changes is going to be some chapter representation on the IMBA board. Who will represent chapters and, and how is that going to be decided? We're just in the very first part of that discussion. And, uh, the, we have a, a committee that uh, is responsible for that, and you know they reached out for me for for my ideas on on how we're going to do that. And uh, we don't know how we're going to select. I mean, that's tough. You've got chapter leaders all across the country, and um, you know how we're going to select that. We, we don't know yet, but um, it it'll be a, a a fair process somehow. And uh, you know, I, I don't I don't know honestly. We're we're going to um, you know be having that discussion soon, but, uh, there's been a lot going on and, you know, getting that person on board for our board meeting in June is, is uh, a goal that I have. So, uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think it's a great addition to our board. You know, we need a chapter voice on our board and, uh, I, uh, I think that's a great idea. And the board was very receptive to that. So, you know, we all want IMBA to succeed and, and there's definitely, um, there's been some challenging times and I think, think there's some challenging times uh, ahead and, um, and what do you and, and, and IMBA, what, what do you need from clubs and chapters alike to make sure that, that, uh, IMBA is, is successful and can be the, the national advocacy group that I think we all really need as, as mountain bikers, what can the community do to make sure that that happens? Well, first and foremost, I, I just think it's really important that, that <laughs> if we can, we can all remember that at, at our very base level, we're all mountain bikers and we ride mountain bikes on, uh, you know, the trails that are probably close to where we live for the most part. And as we, as we, you know, look, you know, go up the sort of, you know, the issues of mountain biking, we get to, to trickier and trickier issues. And at some point, I think we agree on a lot of things at the base. And then as we move up, we have more divisive issues where we tend to, to, to part ways. And instead of starting with those and then just saying, well, I don't, you know, I don't support uh, that organization, whether they're a local organization or IMBA or, or a, a different national organization, I don't support them and anything they do because of, of that. Uh, let's, let's start with what we're united on. And, and we, as mountain bikers, we're not a big group. And right now there is a, a different administration in Washington that there's a lot of, of, of elected officials who want to sell our public lands. I know this isn't as big an issue for folks in the Midwest, but even those people, I think they have a birthright to these lands as public lands, not to be sold off, you know, for extraction and, and exploitation for, you know, natural resources and oil and gas and all that. So we, 
as mountain bikers need to unite, I believe, to, to, to be as strong as we can and to show the, the biggest numbers that we can. Uh, you know, the Inba membership, I think it just hovers around 30,000. It's been there forever. And, you know, that's not a lot of people. Yeah. If, if you do the math on it, it's, it's like the loan estimate is 6 million mountain bikers in the U S which is less than a percent has their Inba membership, which is, which is sad really. And, and it's really disappointing. And that's, and that's really, that's important. If we could just harness, um, you know, you know, a portion of that 6 million, but, you know, much larger portion than we're getting now to say, you know, we're mountain bikers and, and so we're, we're exploring new ways, you know, people for bikes has a great model where you really just have to, you know, check a box and, and get on an email list and, and you're counted as supporting mountain bikers or uh, I'm sorry, it's counted as supporting bicycling. Uh, when when they go to Washington and, and you know we're we're trying to work on similar things for Imba similar ways that mountain bikers can be involved and you know our our member uh, is an average age of 45 years old there's obviously um, a younger group there's women there's uh, you know kids kids on bike is that's a whole different conversation I won't even I won't even go there but yeah we've spent a few episodes on on diversity in in mountain biking and it's and it's something that. Uh, we we generally as as mountain bikers look the same and it's it's important to diversify um you know and and that's that's important to land managers to stakeholders to to government last episode i i spoke with uh with the folks at at access for bikes and and what makes them a little bit different is instead of being a 501c3 they're actually a, a 527 and that allows them to kind of play a little bit differently in the political sphere of things and and so you know, with, with my discussion with, with Evergreen, we, we kind of had a, a, you know, we really agreed on the fact that, that mountain biking is, and cycling in general is, is bipartisan, but there's certainly some, some candidates and some parties that are going to be better for us than others. And, and, and so for myself, you know, I'm, coming from outside of, of the United States, you know, I, I, it sounds to me that the, the reason that IMBA is required is because the U S politics is, is uh, politics in the U S is so controlled by, by corporate lobbyists. And that's why that presence for IMBA to be in DC is so important. But from, from an outsider's perspective, it, you know, it seems like the system's broken and, and then working in that system is, it can be really challenging. And, and I think that, you know, and, and excuse the pun, but, you know, it's Imba's a David, you know, to, to Washington, D.C.'s Goliath. And, and I think a lot of us are kind of sitting there waiting and wondering what's happening and what's going on. And I think, you know, is there a plan to to let the chapters in and, and let the public in and see what's kind of being done behind the scenes with Imba so that we can start to build a little bit of trust for those in the community that have lost the faith in Imba. I think it's important to start to build that trust. And, and so how is that, how is Imba and how are you going to, to begin that process? The one thing that Imba has never uh, done a good job of is communication. And that is absolutely a goal of ours. And if you are, you know, talk with the chapters, I think you'll you'll notice that it's changed 180 degrees. And um, you know, I'm trying to communicate with the chapters weekly. I don't always probably have as much substance to to give them as they'd want. And you're going to start seeing more communication come out of of Imba just generally. So that's that's a goal. And and that was you know our staff uh, has been telling us that for a long time. Uh, when you come in as the you know the the new ED. Uh, you know, maybe it's easy to think that you can just start communicating, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot, uh, you know, I've been immersed in all kinds of things and, um, you know, we're, we're trying to communicate slowly, but these days you, you communicate so many different ways. It's, it's, you know, how you're quoted in, in, in this social media and all of those areas are areas where Imba um, has historically not, you know, not been strong. We have not had a, a marketing presence for a long time. Not that you're talking about marketing, but that is messaging. Mm -hmm, totally. And, and that's something that um, all I can tell you is you're going to start to hear more uh, and more consistent messages out of Imba as we move forward. Uh, and certainly the we're, we're, you know, putting pieces in place 
and working on uh, on improving in those areas. And you know, we've done it with our chapters. I mean, the chapter getting that chapter communication going and just trying to to reengage the chapters uh, was a big first step. And we feel like you know we have progressed in a positive direction on that. And um, there was the initial, okay, Dave's the ED now. We'll do, um, you know, a bunch of articles when I was brand new. Uh, and uh, that's all, you know, come and gone and been out there. And in the meantime, you know, there's been articles written uh, on different sides of the wilderness issue. Wilderness seems to be, um, you know, very prevalent uh, with, you know, the STC getting, getting their new bill introduced and, uh, the new administration, a lot of uh, focus on public lands and and things that are happening, uh, the, the things that are happening in Utah. So that that discussion is is definitely very prominent right now, and um, we're gonna we're gonna start speaking to it. But as you know, uh, we have to be very careful how we speak about it, and it's really pretty a, a pretty simple discussion to to you know say something like, well, I think bikes belong in wilderness. It's not fair. That's pretty easy. It's a little a little trickier to articulate uh, the importance of our relationship with the BLM, the importance of our relationship with the the U.S. Forest Service, and how uh, you know what what fundamental relationships those are to the you know thousands of miles of mountain biking opportunities that we have on on public lands. So that there's there's a lot to it, and, and uh, I, I would just say that you're going to be hearing from from Emma, you're going to be hearing from me. And, uh, you know, certainly we, we haven't done a good job of it in the past, but that communication is everything. But we want, we want it to be, we want to get it right. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to do everything we can to improve in that and, and have enough communication to where people know what IMBA is doing. There's different types, too. On social media, uh, if, we just, if we just use social media to show uh, people what we're doing, I think they'd be blown away. Telling our story, communicating about big issues, wilderness, e-bikes, communicating about what we're doing, highlighting the great work that the chapters and local organizations are doing, uh, calling attention to, to new threats and concerns. Uh, we can do a much better job of that, and that's absolutely a priority, but it's not something that we can just flip a switch on and turn on in a quality way, especially when we're an organization that is, uh, you know, we're working, we're, you know, we're, we're, you know, almost like a startup now where we've got people, uh, you know, wearing a lot of different hats and working in a lot of different directions. But I'll tell you this, it's a really exciting time at IMBA right now um, because of, of everything that's happened. As painful as it's been, I think right now there's, uh, there's a lot of um, confidence in, in my leadership. I hope I can back that up. I come in with a pretty simple concept, I think, of IMBA. I think of two things. I think of access, which is GR, government relations, and I think of trails. We want great places to ride our bikes, and we need to make sure that we protect the, the places to ride the bikes through access and GR. And if we can just focus on those two things, and they're pretty simple, I know there's, you know, that they, they splinter off into a lot of uh, other directions, we will, uh, you know, we've got a lot to do and, and, and we can be successful. It's an exciting time because it's all about about you know having great places to ride mountain bikes yeah. all around this country. Well, Dave, I, I want to thank you for taking the time, and definitely you know this discussion is uh, is certainly going to continue, and and I know the wilderness discussion is a big one too, and and uh, and it'd be great to loop Imba back into that discussion as well because I think you you share a, a, a great side to that, and I, I think it's valuable to hear that. But for the time being, I just want to thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate. It. I know you got a busy schedule, and uh, and just thank you once again. Brent, thank uh, thank you for the opportunity, and I want to thank your listeners uh, for their support. And um, everybody, go out and ride your bikes. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Talk to you soon. It really seems apparent that IMBA is no longer the giant it once was. Staffing is down drastically, and Subaru is no longer a sponsor. Some of the numbers thrown around in my discussion with Dave are hard to verify. IMBA's website doesn't have a complete list of just trail association chapters. I was able to reference the information that I have after contacting and searching each group that IMBA features on their website. Right now, from what I can tell, there are 141 IMBA chapters and 38 SORBA chapters, which puts the total IMBA chapters at 179. 
In the US, there's 605 trail associations working with or advocating for mountain bike trails. I mentioned 37% in the interview, and I actually misspoke there. The number is really 30% of US trail associations are IMBA chapters. As part of the new Chapter 3.0 program, clubs receive half of the revenue they earn from memberships. Initially, IMBA was taking 60%, with huge cuts to regional directors and many services now costing chapters additional fees. It's understandable why some groups are questioning their continued inclusion in the IMBA chapter program. On March 22nd of this year, the Salem Area Trail Alliance announced that they were no longer taking part in the IMBA chapter program. And on March 3rd, the Minnesota Off-Road Cyclists had done the same. The total number of clubs leaving the chapter program is now up to five, which begs the question, are these isolated instances or a sign of a much larger exodus? Next episode, we'll hear from a few of those groups, including the Salem Area Trail Alliance, the Minnesota Off-Road Cyclists, and Mountain Bike Missoula. We'll also hear from Lance Peischer, president of the Bitterroot Backcountry Cyclists in Montana, and learn why his club has decided to stick with the chapter program. I'll also speak with Kevin Adams. He's the former vice president of chapter and member services. He's also with the Verde Valley Cyclist Coalition in Sedona, Arizona. And prior to that, he was with the Mid-Atlantic Off-Road Enthusiasts, also known as MORE. If you're interested in interacting with the show, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at FrontlinesMTB. And brand new this week, I've started adding some of the episodes onto YouTube. So if you're interested in streaming there, you can. They don't include any video content, just another way to stream the audio. I'll be getting all of the episodes on there over the next week or so. If you want to contribute, then please send me an email or audio file, brent at bikeski.ca. And once again, new this week, you can now contact the show directly at frontlinesmtb at gmail.com. Along with a show digging deeper into the IMBA chapter system, you can expect some more topics as we roll into spring. I'll attempt to answer Jay Darby's question on how do we, as trail advocates, communicate to riders when it is or isn't okay to ride certain trails. And a common theme that's come up with my discussions with various clubs is paid staff. I'll be exploring when is the right time for a club to look into bringing on paid staff and how to get started in creating a strategy to make that happen. You can now support the show via PayPal. You can find a link in the show notes. Music is once again by Lee Rosevere and production notes by Jennifer Pride. And finally, I'm Brent Hillier. This is Frontlines. Thanks for listening, and happy trails.